I'm Jeff Denworth. I'm a CMO and co-founder of Vast Data. So Vast Data, what is this all about? Well, when we started the company, we, we kind of looked at how data infrastructure was built, how data was managed, and we saw just a tremendous opportunity to do better. To do better than how systems had been built in the past uh, and build an, a new type of architecture that solved for some of the problems that crept into uh, storage infrastructure, uh, ultimately all kind of spreading out from a white paper that was written by Google in 2003 about a new storage architecture they built called a shared nothing system. Nodes that have a bunch of drives attached to them and you kind of cluster out infrastructure, whether it's storage or database technology um, to essentially achieve some sort of capacity or performance metric. And so here, um, every day as we go into the market, we find that these architectures create challenges. Challenges as these nodes have to communicate with each other for things like metadata and data that's in cache that as you have dynamic environments needs to be evicted and managed and you have all this internal traffic that gets created across a cluster black backplane as um, these systems all have to be kept in, in kind of atomic synchronous communication. You have hotspots that emerge because you'll have nodes that receive requests that have to then distribute those nodes to other nodes that may equally be um, servicing even worse requests. So you have variability of performance. Um, with respect to our pursuits for AI, these systems were never built to support things like InfiniBand. And so um, not really great for high speed parallel IO. And then when a, when a server fails, these can be pretty disastrous in 2020 terms, 2022 terms where you have to rebuild hundreds of terabytes of data. And so ultimately all of that is, is one critical component that we realized we could solve around. But the other major element, and this is what we announced three years ago is we saw an opportunity to build a new type of system that brought an altogether new level of economics into the flash space such that people could afford it for all of their data. We would argue that none of these uh, legacy systems architectures really designed to solve for the problem of flash cost, flash expense. And we realized if we could solve that, then we'd be in a very unique space. And I think we've, as I'll talk about, I think we've kind of delivered on that, that promise. And so what we built is a new type of systems architecture. We call it DAYS. It stands for disaggregated, shared everything. And this DAYS architecture doesn't look like these shared nothing systems of the past. We've combined a bunch of new technologies into a new topology, essentially a sea of Docker containers that all manage the namespace uh, that are all stateless. There's no metadata, there's no cache in them whatsoever. They're just simple Linux machines that are exporting all of the data out that's stored on the other side of a high-speed fabric built of next generation networking technology called NVMe over fabrics. It's one of the reasons that we have uh, NVIDIA here today. And so NVMe over fabrics changes how you think about the relationship between drives and compute. You can completely disaggregate these devices and still give the drives the experience of having direct attached storage performance. And so once you do that, you kind of completely virtualize all the devices. And what we spent all of our time on is a new data structure, a data structure that could live in a combination of high capacity flash, as well as a high capacity storage class memory on the other side of this NVMe fabric. And once you got there and this data structure was available over this fabric to hundreds or thousands of containers at one time, then you can start to manage data in all together new different ways. You can execute global codes that are uh, intended on just completely changing the economics of flash. You can get to altogether new levels of resilience because now when machines fail, you don't really care. You think of these machines more like cattle than pets. And so what's underneath this is exabytes of hyperscale low cost flash. Uh, I think we've been very aggressive in pushing very, very high density flash into the space uh, in a way where people can now afford that for all of their data. And so we've sold a lot um, and we have now a lot of feedback that's come from customers and every day we kind of uh, reconsider or relook at the value propositions that we're delivering to customers. Um, we talk about bringing an end to the hard drive era. We talk about bringing an end to the era of storage tiering because that's a level of complexity that ultimately customers don't want. They just feel that they have to do. And so what comes of this is a system that is just simple. Customers don't have to worry about tiers, they don't have to worry about IO response time, they don't have to worry about protocols, it's all just standard protocols, gobs of flash uh, that you can afford. Second is from the perspective of this new architecture and our scalability goals, we kind of sat at a time where people were thinking about storing exabytes in single systems. 
And so we wanted to build a system that you could actually process exabytes of data into. And these containers, they don't talk to each other. So you get linear scalability as you build out the system because there is no cache coherence code. There's no communication between them. And as a result, you get to really high levels of scale. And um, on top of that, resilience grows as the cluster grows. In terms of cost efficiency, we're now to the point where we're routinely replacing hard drive based archives. And that's something that a lot of people didn't think that they would experience in this time. Uh, and I think, you know, kind of the too good to be true story. A lot of people doubted that we could achieve this, but I think we have. And then ultimately, once all of your data is on this really large, scalable, resilient pool of flash, the question is, what do you do with it, right? And um, in this case, what we find is that people are now just getting crazy returns out of this infrastructure in terms of time to results. One of my favorite quotes is, uh, we work with a genomics processing organization called Invite, Invite uh, actually up in the Bay Area. And they went from doing all their COVID pipelines, it took about 24 hours to sequence a genome and go through all the analytics on it. They went down to 15 minutes with VASC and GPUs. And so this is the place that we're taking people to. We're basically removing all the bottlenecks or constraints for your applications in terms of performance. Now, our, our concept we call universal storage. And from a business perspective, it's it quite interesting when you have this system that breaks the trade-off between capacity and performance. You have one system that gives you both and you don't have to compromise on this anymore. And so the way we sell it is, um, you know, we get a, a first use case that we work on with a customer. Maybe that's like AI or, or Splunk or something like that. And they make an initial investment and these investments are pretty large. I'll show you what that means in a minute. And let's say that's a million dollars. Well, then the customer starts buying more because data is growing. They realize that what we're making just works uh, and it becomes a comfortable platform for them to kind of trust and put their data into. And then as time goes on, what happens is we start adding other use cases. We call it universal storage because we think it defies the classic categorizations of storage infrastructure. You can use it for virtually anything. And so that from a business perspective, that means that our customers that are buying from us, they make an reasonably large initial investments. And then they just start scaling up more and more and more over time. Uh, we've got single customers that in our first three years have spent over $60 million on vast infrastructure. So um, we take a lot of things seriously, customer support we take seriously, uh, QA we take seriously, um, but we're maniacal about supporting the largest customers in the world. We did this um, exercise a few weeks ago where we just reached out to customers and we asked them to fill out this anonymous survey form that came from Gartner. I said, okay, you know, just uh, go tell Gartner you like us is kind of what the sales guys um, did, but um, we didn't really coach the customers much on this at all. And um, when everything was done, we had about 25 responses. And the interesting thing is we kind of looked at these responses is that 100% of the customers that bought our product and answered these surveys said that they would recommend us. And I think that speaks to the capability of the product, but also the fact that it just works and it's just simple. And we're a great company behind this product that's helping our customers every day not feel like they're on an island. But the big update today is the business story that has come from all of this focus and all this energy that we've applied to transforming customers' relationships with data. And uh, I think it was last week we announced our, our kind of end of year results, our year closes on January 31st of, the, of each year. Uh, and we exited last year to $300 million software run rate. So to put that into perspective, if you add hardware, you're talking about something about, about a half a billion dollar run rate that the company's on right now in terms of infrastructure being sold into the market. That's in three years time. This is unprecedented in the space. Now, there's also some really interesting stories that are underneath that because we're all, all software, um, it's 90% gross margin. So the company is, is generating a fair bit of cash. Uh, and that shows in the fact that we've actually achieved cash flow positivity at the end of last year. And so just to put this into perspective, you have an organization that's growing between three to four X on an annualized basis that is not burning venture capital. And if you look outside of storage, if you look outside of infrastructure, if you think about software startups in total, that has never been accomplished in the startup world. And so we feel like we're in a very unique space. And it's not that we're trying to not spend cash, but the, what's happening is that the customers are spending more than we anticipate. And so our average selling price is $1.2 million of software support for about a three-year contract uh, of, of universal storage. And the, the metric that we like the best is a metric that investors use called net recurring revenue. And it basically means at the beginning of the year, you measure how much of a customer has spent the year prior or how they ended that year. And then as a subscription model, you kind of look at the end of the year and you assess how much more have they decided to spend throughout that year. And our net retention 
uh, rate is 300%. That means that customers, as they get out of the year, they've spent on average three times more than what they were spending at the beginning of the year. So I think that's the ultimate validation. You know, you can talk about Gartner surveys and all of this, but customers that trust us with their data, uh, and we feel like we're, the, we're, we're helping them be the, the custodians of their data. You say you, you talk about software, but actually your uh, customer are consuming a lot of hardware. They are. So how, how do you manage the sale at the point? So do you have partners that do the integration at this point? Because at the beginning of the business goes through partners. We announced in February of last year, a program called Gemini. And basically it's a retooling of the business model of storage. And essentially the way that it works is that we specify a number of hardware platforms that our customers can deploy on. I'm gonna talk about one today. And ultimately um, that gets manufactured by two manufacturers, Avnet in the US, Telad uh, in, in Asia. And these two organizations are just building the platforms to our spec and the partners are ordering from them. And those organizations, they'll, they'll place the whole order to them, hardware and software. And we basically just get a check for the software component of it. So what you don't have with Vast is a bunch of salespeople running into your office every three years saying, hey, you need to refresh your arrays because our salespeople don't get paid for that. Our customers are buying at cost. I met with last night, one of the largest hyperscale customers in the world. And they love the fact that they get visibility directly into the bomb. They can see everything and they can go work with their manufacturers if they like. But on the flip side, we don't give customers full latitude to do whatever they want because then every project would be an integration project. And so we specify the hardware because we want our support team to really know and trust the platform. And we want it to work well with our software. And so we believe that the hardware platforms that we do work on are at the time, the best expression of the capabilities of the software. Okay. Okay. So I want to put the business in, in, in terms of, um, um, I got you, uh, in, in terms of like how we think of ourselves as compared to uh, next generation software companies. And we kind of looked at some of the most successful organizations in the space. And you can see two things. One is that relative to our growth rate, there's almost no burn. Uh, and two is we're starting to enter into an atmosphere that is kind of reserved for some of the largest and most successful software companies in the data space. So we're on a continued trajectory throughout the year. When we come back next year and we update you on how we're doing, we expect this bar to be much, much larger. And all of it's powered by an opportunity that um, we find pretty much in every industry, every market, which is artificial intelligence. Um, and it's, people like to think about these as like, um, new workloads that are sitting in, your, in the corner of your data center. And what we find every day is that AI is just being embedded into classic applications as much as being used to build new products and services. And so our capital, which is uh, Arc Invest, which is one of the largest um, technology investment firms in the world, recently estimated what the spend would be on data infrastructure for uh, deep learning by 2030. And they they basically called a, um, a $400 billion total systems number, $400 billion. You're talking about something that's much larger than the entire data storage industry today, just for deep learning. So they're revising up the estimates that are coming from organizations like Gartner and IDC. They're looking at some of the investments that are being made by the hyperscalers and estimating how much that will become democratized over time. And you now see customers that are basically building hundred or multi hundred million dollar AI clusters, uh, we're powering a few of them. And we're starting to see this now become democratized farther and farther out into the market.